Hello, it's December 23rd, 2017. I'm Tony Smario. Coming to you from Rosal.org YouTube channel. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Um, <laughs> this is a this is just going to be a strange message, I think, um, in the sense that I really wanted. There's so many things to talk about. I've been wanting to get back to the Bible study. I've been a little bit um, busy this week with a few things that came up that I didn't plan on that distracted me. And also, I'm very excited. The last Bible study made me really ponder how much of, you know, how much of the story's been given to us in a way that's completely hidden the real story from our view or the truly it's like the you know the images on the cave plato's cave you know we've been getting those images nothing but those images played for us and yet there's a colorful world of scripture perhaps waiting to be discovered but most people won't believe that as in the analogy with plato's cave because there's you know, this is the Bible. This is what my father believed. This is what my grandfather believed. I mean, you know, I got a, I got cousins that have been, you know, <laughs> accepted into the Vatican. I didn't work with popes. You know, I'm, I'm Italian, so we must have many proud uh, relatives who have uh, young sons or daughters that have been accepted into the fold. Roman Catholic Church and so it's it's made me reflect on so many things this week uh, it's made me anxious at the idea of looking into the other books of you know like it's I know it's slow going but we don't have to go through all of Genesis I just like to get through this first week of creation to get our minds open to what's really going on with regard to uh, a revisionist concept of it that when we look at the scripture we're looking at something that's been given to us in a propagandized version just like our world or would seem to be thus far so I'm anxious to jump to Revelation next and see if the Greek you know how much of that are we able to see through some of the manipulated traditional meanings that has been given for us so we could believe in a devil coming from the sky and a you know this very um shallow uh exoteric version of religion and so that's why i thought well it makes sense right now with christmas you know to maybe talk a little bit about that you know our our christmas is just quite literally a you know, a, a witch's brew of propaganda, traditional lies, wool being pulled over the eyes of the true believer. I mean, unfortunately, that's what Christmas really is. They've, they've been able to create that on the back of or with the image of love your neighbor. Right, Christmas is a time of giving, and we pull all the heartstrings, all the sentiment sentiments in the human uh, consciousness through our propaganda and advertising when Christmas time rolls around. And uh, if you watch Ron Howard's movie, The Grinch That Stole Christmas, you know you see the message there that. Christmas has been turned into a commercial product and all about the gifts and all about the money and all about the showiness. But really, it's about the love. And I, you know, would like to interject as a possible insight. That the, you know, there's a reason Ron Howard is who he is in a world like Hollywood, which is what it is. So that those sort of stories when you know that the destruction of christianity and of religion is of uh, that is what the great work that's what's going on they destroyed or got control of 
through the destruction and starvation and decimation of Orthodox Christianity in the first world times of the Bolshevik Revolution and the decades following. I mean, for decades and decades and decades, having to root out and all that, you know, I mean, that's where Christianity ran to, out of the Middle East. So that's, you know, that's where all those beliefs had been rooted in the longest. So we don't hear anything about that. <clears throat> with all our world of Russian aggression and Russia, Russia, Russia. Nobody, you know, none of them ever seemed to uncover the idea, the real history over the last hundred years, or at least of the Orthodox Christians. And the banks went and overtook them a hundred years ago. Killed the czars, if that's the case. Anyway, the czars were taken out of power. I mean, whether the history, the story of killing them is true, or whether that's just more story like killing Hitler, like any of our stories, nuclear weapons like Hiroshima and Nagasaki, like, you know, all of our BS, Columbus discovering America, you know, the history, it's all false. And so Christmas must be seen as sort of a crowning achievement of all that falsity, all that manipulation and propaganda co-opting something real, which of course is that true spirit of God, of giving, of love, and making it your own, meaning making it part of your arsenal, part of your list of assets. Christianity is no longer a true opposition to anything in the world. It's a tool. The only Christianity, that's why, you know, the Church of Philadelphia has little strength. The people that are loving their neighbor, there are not too many of those left at the end. They're not an army. <laughs> they, they don't have weapons of mass destruction. They can't go free people and take people over. The real Christians have little strength because the only other praiseworthy church is the one, you know, that have nothing at all. So... The Philadelphians are obviously the ones that have something and they choose to share it. They choose to give it. They choose to love their brother with it. The other church there, was it Smyrna or Thyatira? I forget which one. I think Smyrna's praise for, you know, you're poor and persecuted, but I say you're rich. Hang on. So I look at the world today and I think, you, you know, you get all the Christians of Africa, the persecuted Christians of places like Russia or the Middle East that have been purposely persecuted since they went and co-opted Islam to do the persecution <laughs> in the Middle East. Um, anyway, I know it's a little off track, but I'm, I told you, I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about a lot of how, how many roads intersect right now at this Christmas celebration the intersection of the whole history of my life being a, a propagandized lie to live in a country that claims to be free and great that's neither, a country that's supposed to be Christian that's an that's a absurd offense to even pretend that when we're the country that rewards the few people that do nothing but steal and turn the masses into slaves and then let the people who've stolen everything use us as a military tool to steal everything else around the world. That's not very Christian, you know. So to pretend we're a Christian country is a lie. We don't even permit sort of Christian um, public demonstration anymore, right? You can't have a statue at a school, even... Especially if it's a public school, it can't be dedicated in the name of Jesus or in the name of Christianity or in the name of some saint. Or it just can't be. That's now becoming illegal in the great free Christian America. Under this really weird argument that they'd already went over before, they just came down on the other side of it. It's not that it makes... It's not that it's unfair to everyone else to promote Christianity among other 
belief systems because in those other belief systems where they come from, it's illegal to believe anything else. If you're in the Middle East, you, you're in a community that's either Christian or Islamic or Jewish, most likely. And not too many atheist gay communities exist in worshiping uh, Ashtoreth or anything else, worshiping the golden unicorn or the crystal pyramid or... I mean, you might be doing that in private, but boy, you better keep quiet, right? So in all these other countries where these other religions originate or come from, it's, nor it's the norm that they're kept exclusive. And it is a national religion. It's, it's sort of religion first and nationalism second, or at least they share an equal red team, blue team, divide and conquer method where in america the whole idea from the beginning was separation of church and state so that i mean under the guise that i mean what it allowed of course was the the militarization the uh, the turning of human beings into slaves for the corporation it allowed America now to do things other countries couldn't do because other countries had some sort of God that they had to, to deal with, even in their politics. But America, oh, no, no, no. Now, the upside of the fact that there is no more God in politics, you know, we do whatever we want in politics. That's a separate arena. The upside of that is now you can do whatever you want in church. There is no official national religion. You can believe whatever you want. Worship any golden calf. Worship anything you want. And theoretically, the thing that was touted or was sold, I should say, as bringing you that freedom and that ability was the Christian faith. The fact that this guy died for everybody. In this guy, everybody's equal. In this one man, in this one religion, is no religion superior. See? So, the whole idea of setting up these monuments originally was that they were what was the, the story behind all the freedom. It was because we were Christian that we could tolerate everyone as he tolerated everyone, that we could forgive everyone as he forgave everyone, that we could accept everyone and point to the one door and say, well, you can do what you want, but he's the door. So that was the whole reason that they could argue that the statues you know, could, could be there in the first place in a place where you're, you're touting freedom of all religions. Yeah, but it's because of this religion that we have freedom of all religions. Now they're using the other argument to say that that the whole separation of church and state trumps the the um, the historical argument or the historical narrative of claiming that you know Christianity supplied the the freedom. Now somehow we get to just say that. America supplied the freedom and Christianity doesn't get any more higher claim than anyone else. So the point, it was, it was never a Christian country. The founding fathers were never Christian. They were just dealing with a lot of Christian people. That's what you have to realize over history. That's why the war has been on Christianity and religion in general. Anywhere that, anywhere that message of Noah sprung up, <laughs> That there's a God to worship, and, and you worship that God by being fair. And, you know, fair to your neighbor, fair to each other. You know, that, that story. Because against that was the story that there is no God but, but us. And eventually no, no God at all, just animals. We're all just animals. But before that story, before the Darwinian concept, even though there was always materialism, it was never very popular. If you look in history, 
not very many people accepted the idea that there was nothing else but a material universe. Confucius didn't see it that way. The Hindus certainly didn't see it that way. The Hebrews didn't see it that way. So when, when you go back, the Persians didn't see it that way. The Egyptians didn't see it that way. So that, that's a little newer, you know, that's what you'd call in our world a very modern uh, popular concept that people come from animals and there's nothing behind it except, the, you know, atoms, you know, what, what we now call subatomic energy, but it still comes down to there existing nothing but this energy. Where that energy comes from isn't important, it just is. It's it's what is. Just this sea of energy that exists, boundless, I suppose. It's just, I don't know. It's very interesting. How, you know, how can you not explain it dimensionally? How can there be just a sea of energy? It just is, and it just goes forever. No beginning, no end, but it is the origin of everything, including our own minds and our own thoughts, because, of course, along those lines, our minds and thoughts can only be accidents. Nobody planned them. No one created them. They're not a, somebody didn't say, well, if I put the molecules or the energy together this way, I'll get a speaking thing, a thinking thing. No, nobody did that. It just, boops, it happened that way. The bunch of energy started taking on form according to the principles of of physics, light and, and moisture and heat, and right? Things just started growing out of the energy. Eventually became conscious, eventually became our thoughts. All, you know, the strange part is, is in history, those thoughts, when they finally show up in some sort of recorded form, you know, boom, right off the bat, it's all a spiritual thing. It's all gods, you know, the Hindu stuff, the Hebrew stuff, Egyptian stuff. And nothing in there about just being a bunch of energy. So once, let's say Babylon, let's say that's our, our focus point of it all. Emerald tablets and, right, the, the Kabbalah. The understanding, if you will, we, we could say a, a undermining or an understanding, depending on who you were at the time, of looking at these ancient, because by, by the time of, of Babylon, whatever happened in the time of Enoch <laughs> was ancient history. Noah and his kids were ancient history. Abraham, you know, even by the our accounts, figuring Abraham somewhere in a couple of thousand years before Christ. You've got, say, 500 to 600 years before Christ, the Babylonian Empire. So, you know, you know 1,500 years. If we go back 1,500 years, yeah, that's pretty ancient history, isn't it? We don't know much about our history 1,500 years ago. So, you know, if you look at it that way, there have been a lot of, I mean, let's take a pause to consider that the adversary, we haven't gotten to these words yet in our Bible study, but our Bible study is showing that we need to keep our minds open. That maybe the word adversary that was turned into the word Satan isn't about a little red pitchfork thing flying around outer space for fighting against God's angels in heaven, the space capital. Uh, but maybe it is just what it really does represent in that word adversary, as in heaven is within you. As in, you know where I'm going, Philip, you know the way. 
whoever he said that to? How do we know where you're going? How do we know the way? Jesus. Because that way is in us. It's a matter of just deciding to give, to deciding that we know God. We, you know, we, we know God. We know the way to eternal life. It's in giving this life. You know, all these parables of Jesus, these strange, almost koans, right? You gain this life by losing it. You get by giving. How's that, you know, how's that work, really? How do I get by giving? Well, you know, we must be talking about something dimensional here. What, what we could also call spiritual. I'm just, I try and use other words to let the mind see other ideas. But spiritual doesn't mean things floating in space. It really means more like a dimensionally structured existence that has a purpose of which this moment in time is but a expression of that whole purpose. The miracle in it all seems to be the human freedom, the conscious freedom, the what Paul seemed to gather as a, you know, when I read, I don't think it was in Romans, maybe it was, where Paul expresses that what came first wasn't the spiritual, but the physical, then the spiritual, that first the dirt, the man of dust, then God breathed spirit into the dust. Now, to me, that's a very strong argument for this concept of evolution, which to me seems to be just a big pile of propaganda that's been sold. But where do we separate the propaganda from the truth? Isn't propaganda to hide truth? So don't, you know what I mean? When you try to sell somebody something, doesn't it have to pass a certain muster to, to, so that the lie can be carried out? I guess an analogy would be um, fly fishing. Anyone who knows anything about fishing at all, or especially fly fishing, knows that, funny enough, fish are, are so uh, used to eating a certain thing, even at a certain time of year or at a certain temperature of the water, that you need to present a fish with some semblance of that thing. And it has to pass a certain level or the fish won't touch it. But if it does look like, if it's an artificial lure, they call it an artificial bait, and it looks like the real McCoy enough to fool a fish, son of a gun, they, they bite that piece of plastic or that piece of feather, that metal hook, because it looks like the real thing, not because it's just advertises itself as a, as a trap. And so I think there's an analogy there for how you fool people, how every lie works. It works by shading the truth in something that's believable. You know, a falsity that's believable. And so when you look at our propaganda coming down to us, that's why the Grinch that stole Christmas has to be wrapped in the truth, which is, you know, Christmas has become about the gifts about the money when it's not about that at all. It's about the love. But I challenge you to find me the word Jesus or Messiah or Deliverer or Savior mentioned in that movie once. I, I, I challenge anyone to find me an association with the actual historical thing that is the impetus of that very story being mentioned in that very story. See, this is, an, you know, this is the deeper insight here with, as far as the Grinch and Ron Howard and these guys. You know, they know what they're doing. They know who their enemy is. If not Ron Howard, the people who employ him and say, here's the script I want. And when he says, don't you think we should make a reference here to the Son of God or 
the Messiah, they tell him, don't you dare. If you do, we'll find another director. And so you learn right away. Okay, <laughs> they want to hear no Jesus references unless it's where they've got Jesus written in to be stereotyped into the into the drumbeat repetition of brainwashing their traditional view into your mind of the Jesus that's sending, you know, the Left Behind series, right? Shoot, when I saw Nicolas Cage in that movie not long, you know, so many years ago, I thought, whoa, wait a minute. The, wait a minute, you mean the establishment wants the whole world to know that the Bible says you got to believe in Jesus or you're going to get left behind because there's a rapture coming. Hmm, that's interesting, huh, guys? So, you think it's because they don't know the story? I say, and the more I look into it, it's because <laughs> the story we know is the one they've given us about a rapture and devil with pitchforks and a heaven and hell and that's, that's what they've given us. And so the Christmas is the Christmas they've given us. It's got nothing to do with the Messiah. It's got nothing to do with anybody really given of themselves, except mostly in selfish ways, right? We give gifts to people we love, not to people we don't love, right? We don't go help people who, you know, we don't even know we go spend the little bit of money we could use to help those people by buying crap mostly that nobody needs for people we do love, just to show them we love them, which is great. But again, is that really the way? I mean, is that what the method that Jesus, you know, is that the way he sent his people out? Is that what the first church did? Is that what Paul and John teach? Is that what, what you're going to find Jesus doing on Christmas Day? Uh, you know, it's we've created a beautiful vision around it. And, and that's the part, I guess, that's the deeper message that I'd like people to hear. Is that the deception and the propaganda is very good. It's not, it's not, you know, when you see that offensive in your face kind of propaganda, a Nazi with swastika and a Hitler mustache, you know, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, you know, this kind of offensive in your face propaganda that has no subtlety to it whatsoever. You know for sure that that's not anybody's real, there's no real truth there. That's perfectly exoteric. That's on the outside. That's for you know, that's for sports fans willing to trample each other over a controlled sport in which the same player they're willing to kill you over insulting today, they'll be insulting tomorrow when he gets traded to the to the team they don't like, right? And they're willing to literally commit a crime today for their team and tomorrow commit the same crime against the other team. So, you know, and this is nationalism brought into its lowest form, you know. At least nationalism, you, you can bring people to a deeper, you can ring a deeper heart string, right? Like all our, our emotional romances that keep us stuck in their system of this false love based on buying diamond rings and having big houses and being these somehow Hollywood couples that don't really exist, although you got all these weird types that try and emulate it, and don't they look happy for those of us who know or have served in our capacity as the servants for those people and been able to observe them close up. And yes, don't they look happy and, and Christian in that sense of giving and loving everyone and accepting right? <clears throat> That's never shown to us in our perfect little characterizations of our perfect little people on our televisions, is it? These people, if you notice, they always have these gargantuan homes or, you know, lavish accommodations, no matter who they are. 
And rarely are those being shared with anyone. Rarely are the homeless being brought into any of our vision as I was brought abruptly into my vision by going to one of the most popular tourist cities in the country or the world, one of the most rich in resource and even modern um, affluence. Seattle is just one of those country uh, cities in the world today that's got everything. They just got it going on. High tech is there. They got natural resources. They just really, they got tourism. Real estate is purported to be one of the strongest in the country, though there's no such thing in an economy that's really, you know, a house of cards. But that house of cards, in that house of cards, Seattle's the strongest uh, pillar in the real estate and other markets. So here, you know, like San Francisco all my life was, and, and probably still is, uh, as far as financially, but all my life, San Francisco was just one of those cities, just can't, you can't touch San Francisco for its wealth of natural resources, tourism, you know, everything's going on there, real estate, commerce. And yet, what kind of communities are going on where you got, <clears throat> excuse me, all the wealth, no matter what community, no matter what city or state, Everything seems to run like clockwork in the sense that the very few corporations or, or somehow um, interests with great money and influence, corporate or not, wind up with all the resources and all the general population winds up as worker bees. And I can even hear people responding in their knee-jerk propagandized, brainwashed, brain-dead response, like overpopulation. How do you know? Have you counted people? Does it look any more overpopulated to you than when you grew up? It all looks the same to me. Go out into the country. The country looks the same. It's five minutes out of the city and whoop, trees, cows, streams, just like it always been. I don't know. Doesn't look like there's 10 times as many people all over the planet now suddenly. Cities are, you know, they just keep packing them in. It makes it harder for them to manage the population. So maybe that's what we could call overpopulation is difficulty for, you know, a hundredth of 1% to manage all of the people when they keep growing in these cities where they've been put. And there's no work for them anymore. There's no space for them anymore. And the only alternative would be to sort of cut them loose toward the country and give them all that space that you've coveted for yourself. So what you give them instead is a story called overpopulation and get them all hyped up to kill each other or be thrilled about the idea that the more we kill, the more we tackle ever-burdening problem of overpopulation, which of course is just a lie, just like the lie of, that's just the way it is. It's natural. It's natural. Show me in nature where, where one small group run the rest like slaves. You have your patriarchs. You have your patriarch whales or elephants. You even have your ants in your system. You have your honeybees in your system. But in that system, do the ants that run it, do the bees that run it, do the whales that run it own everything? Or are they just responsible and live the same as everybody else? But but they're the ones with who have shouldered the most responsibility or have somehow the most to offer the community through strength or brilliance and therefore have earned this position not so much earned it but have been elevated naturally into a position of authority but is the authority to own everything that everyone else has i mean when you look at dolphins and whales it's the ones in authority you know they make sure everybody eats they don't leave sick behind they slow the whole herd down to keep the sick with them. 
until they can die a dignified death, and then they can move on at a faster pace. That's just the way whales and dolphins do it. So, you know, I find only humans justify letting a few people own everything and tell everybody else what, what to do, even though they don't abide by the very things they tell everybody else to do. They're not the most respectable. They simply own everything. Like, I mean, I don't know how to even put what terms are, what is, what, there are no other terms. It's a purely human concept, a slave master that fences off and owns everything and keeps all their slaves in their little gated communities and tells them what they can do and what they can't do. And they themselves live above and beyond that law. They don't live that way. They don't have to abide by those standards. But the people do. And so it's remarkable to me that the people themselves have been able to give up their spirit over the ages. And I, as I've always argued, I believe that must be why the indigenous people had to be destroyed like the true Christian, the real believer in a spiritual world, the real believer that there's a God to serve beyond politics, beyond money, beyond myself. I'm the product of something larger than me. I'm a child of God in that parlance. And therefore, I'm part of a family that has a, that has a, a rulership that's beyond the human realm. And therefore, I'm subject to that rulership. We all are. Whether we know it or not, like it or not, agree with it or not, doesn't matter. You're still subject to it. And so that's the whole identity that a, a person of belief, quote unquote, the characteristics that should be overwhelming to anyone that, you know, outside of that belief. That here's a person that simply has a higher authority. And it doesn't, you can't buy them, you can't beat them, you can't threaten them, you, you know, you can't own them. You can't own them. And so that's why the religious and the indigenous, when you look at them, could you own an indigenous, say, Native American who didn't believe there was such a thing as private owner, that a tree couldn't be owned by any person? A, you know, the land couldn't be owned. The tree, the land, the earth, the lake. The birds and everything, this stuff was, you know, we're just passing through and it's here. We can only use it. And and they believe there was some sort of spirit that gave them the, the right to interact with all that creation and use it while they were here. And then they would move on into that and become part of that world that was being used. Do you think you could come to someone like that and say, yeah, but I'll pay you more if you cut all those trees down so we can build a bunch of houses that, you know, don't do good for anybody but us, this small group that's going to pay you, right? You can't buy that kind of spirit, see? You can't own it. So when that spirit was encountered, it had to be conquered. And when you look at, most of the history of mankind, it would seem to be the ugly history of conquering the unconquerable spirit of man, the side that was religious and spiritual, that just had a higher authority. And so that, ha that ha has always been the battle, I think. I mean, if I have to look at it, it's just really trying to organize in my mind a framework for all of this. That's got to be it. And that's what leads to the Kabbalah. That's what leads to it all be seen, seen as allegorical. Because there is no authority higher than me. I'm my own authority. I'm God. You're God. You know, if I step on your toes, you got the right to wipe me out because I'm not letting anything in the way of my vision. I'm God. And, you know, it's all there is. My mind is the apex of the pyramid. And so once that's understood, all religion can be allegorical. It can all be put into an allegorical framework.
And and that's been the division, I think, all along. And if you go if you go all the way back to there and and imagine that from five, six hundred years before the time of Messiah, there's been this division of man, the you know, the adversary in in us that doesn't want to be bound by a higher authority had finally worked it out you know it took as i say maybe from noah who knows maybe from abraham a couple of thousand more years 1500 years and man finally worked out how to be his own god how to be free from authority and so he codified that he turned that into a religious expression in response and that seems all very natural to me. See, that, that, that makes sense. Any kind of, even a poet, a writer, a, a rebel of any kind has to be responding to the conditions that they're faced with. Nobody can write about what they've never experienced. Right? Nobody knows what another dimension looks like. That's why you you get such feeble writing when you when you try to, you know, when you get writing about heaven or hell, you get stereotypical, you know, everything based on sort of Dante, a, a physical version of stairways high places or low places, you know, all metaphors, allegories that are shallow because what else are we going to draw from? What, how are how you going to put it into a metaphor? What, where are you going to go with your mind to get the data to analyze whether you've got a correct vision of the next dimension? You just can't. And that's why all our scripture is bound that's why all of our art, our expression, but that's what makes it, see, that's what makes it human. That's what makes it short term. That's what makes it perishable, I think. That's this perishable body that Paul spoke about that will give way to an imperishable body that isn't based on that sort of imperfect knowledge in an imperfect environment not you know not imperfect in the it's a weird word let's just say in this dimension it's uh limited corruptible might be also seen as limited as well as imperfect an incorruptible body might be seen as this unlimited body of of light the capacity to to have light without darkness and yet retain the memory of darkness i can't see that this this life is anything else it doesn't seem to have any other meaning to me it, it, barring that sort of dimensional spiritual purposeful expression it's back to uh, energy turning itself into animal, planetary, you know, space turning itself into consciousness, coming up with all these silly dreams for ourselves, because that's just what what the what the energy is doing right now for no purpose whatsoever and with no foundation. Um, no reason, I should say. The foundation is simply that energy is moving through the cortex of our brain and, and based on all the things that our little microchip of a brain has received, perhaps through many existences, well, no, that's not true in the material sense. Everything we've received like an animal from the time we first started imprinting as a baby or even in the fetal sense, in the womb, up till this moment, you know, that's the data that makes my brain and your brain think, but there's nothing behind it. You know, 
every time I face that abyss of reality, because it's possible, I find it, it erases all the things that truly need explanation. Why there's such a thing as love. Why there's all this human concept of giving. You know, this whole thing about Christmas that makes Christmas so special that they've been able to ride on is because it carries that germ of truth. That giving is the greatest gift in the world. That when we give, we feel better than we can ever feel. When we help someone in need, give of ourself, act absolutely unselfishly with a purpose to be unselfish, because that's this whole idea of Christmas nowadays is that, you know, that's the germ of truth, is it's being unselfish and giving and loving and forgiving and all that. And it's just doing it with that purposefulness. But see, that's the original Christian message right there. It's the purposefulness of being giving, not just doing it because it makes you feel good today on Christmas, but that purposefulness, because that's what the master showed was the way to eternal life. That's the, that's the way you're supposed to act every day is the way toward eternal life, which is why then you have to put your, your Christmas BS through that filter. You know, the way you're supposed to act every day is it to go out shopping in the commercial market, buying cards and Christmas gifts with ribbons and bows made in China out of plastic that's just, you know, all this this offense to the world, is that the Christmas spirit carried on every day? You know, does it take ribbons and bows to feed people and, and make people warm or, or make people feel loved? Or people who are lonely in hospitals or in old folks, elder elderly, you know, residences or or prisons even, doesn't Jesus make mention, you came to visit me in prison? You don't think that's important to him, huh? One of the odd anecdotes in the scripture, that, ha and it's tied into telling you righteous, come on in you righteous, that didn't, you know, you did it for me. But you went to visit one of my, least of my little ones in prison? Come on in you righteous. So what's that mean, you know, visiting someone in prison? So these are the real Christian, you know, the Christmas acts that if we all carried them on every year, of course, we change the world. And that's what our master, the Messiah that they call Jesus. I and mean, that's what he, you know, that's his, that's, the, that's his teaching. Nobody else's. Ron Howard don't own that. Hollywood didn't think of that. But do they give any credit? To the master who, who laid all that out at a time when that was not a very popular thought. You get by giving. You live by dying. Get on your knees and clean the feet of your servant. Love your enemy. Huh? How's that going to get me ahead in this world? How's that going to stop the onslaught of Sodom and Gomorrah? Seattle and San Francisco. So, the teaching is quite original. I defy anyone to show me someone prior to Jesus that talked anything so crazy as that. And so, to bring it into a modern day where a guy like Ron Howard makes a film like The Grinch, and the message is the message of Jesus, but there's no mention of Jesus. No mention that that's where the message comes from. Just that that's what Christmas is. Because, see, what's really coming in this future predicted, I think, by Revelation, Daniel. We'll have to go back now and we'll, we'll double check. But what we think is coming in this world of complete persecution of Christianity, final persecution under an antichrist, false deliverer, not the Messiah, a not Messiah, not a little devil with a pitchfork, a not Messiah. 
an antichrist. Not this is there's the Messiah and then there's the not Messiah. This is there's been a lot of not messiahs, said John. But they say they'll come one last not messiah. He didn't do away with anybody claiming Jesus was the Messiah. That's what the last two witnesses have to be pointing out. Jesus was the, that's what the witnessing has got to do with. That's what the witnesses got killed about in the early days. Hey, the Messiah came. Messiah was Jesus. Or Joshua, this Nazarene. That was the Messiah. They said, you got to stop saying that. Paul originally said, you got to stop saying that or we'll kill you. We have the right to kill you. We have the obligation to kill you. At least shut you up. And so, you know, the last two witnesses have to be people saying, Jesus is the Messiah. So that's got to be in the face of a world saying, the Messiah has arrived. The one the Jews have been waiting for. Someone's got to say, well, what, you mean it isn't Jesus? <laughs> right? So somebody's got to be saying, no, that's not the Messiah. So that Messiah is going to be who was characterized by the Grinch in Ron Howard's picture. See, the wrongfully ousted one, the one the religious people in their stupidity wrongfully hated all, their, all those generations while they, while they destroyed the Christmas spirit. Right? If you analyze what was really told in that story, the Grinch that stole Christmas, it was how the religious people carrying on had turned Christmas into a commercial enterprise and all they're interested in is themselves, their gifts and their stature and their big celebrations. And in it all, they'd forgotten the one lonely personage, character, that years before had been wrongly accused or wrongly destroyed, see? And so that in our modern day is the image of this Messiah who's trying to say everyone's God. That's the Babylonian God that says we're all God. God is a path. And so when that Messiah comes around again, and says that it's all an allegory. That's why he's going to stop the sacrifice. We don't you know, we don't do this anymore. We don't need to do this anymore. This all stands for something else. So the Grinch is the forgotten past ostracized past, not forgotten, but ostracized, demonized, that yet brings back the true moral, the true reality of Christmas. Again, with no mention of who or, you know, where, where it really comes from. Grinch didn't point back and say, wait a minute, Christmas is about the one who died for everybody. The one who gave his life, the one, the man that gave his life for other men. That's a Christmas, you know, that's the origin of this giving spirit. The Grinch doesn't say that, does he? But he brings you back to it's about loving, forgiving, giving of yourself, not giving Christmas presents, not giving money. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. In the modern world, that's why they can commission something like that, which to a Christian seems so Christian. But you watch how in my perspective is that in this world that's coming, the Grinch represents the Antichrist, represents the not Messiah that Christianity is going to accept because or the world's going to accept because it's going to show how Christianity was the big brute all along the one that ruined it for everyone all along, that misunderstood the scripture all along and turned it into a commercial venture of control and lost the spirit. So the Antichrist is going to bring back the spirit of Christmas. I want people to realize that. 
That's the, that's the moral of the Grinch, who stole Christmas. The Antichrist, the one that's shunned and ostracized and demonized, is the one who's going to bring back the spirit of Christmas in the face of the Christianity who, as in the end of the Grinch, is going to accept it. Oh, thank you, Grinch, for reminding us it's all about love, not about presence. See, so my vision is they're going to blame the whole presence thing on Jesus, which is true because Catholicism, the, the co-opting of the story took the real Messiah, Joshua, out of the story in the second century, introduced hell in the third or fourth century, right? And for 1,500 years has been manipulating and undermining Christianity as it has all, you know, it's been Rome, you know, as you, if you just look at the three city states in the world, right? Obviously, Washington, the last one, was started to, the District of Columbia, was started as the militarized arm that was beyond reproach. We can kill anyone, terrorize anyone, build any type of dis despicable weapon, do it all in secret, and there's just no oversight in the District of Columbia. In the city of London, well, we have the historical banking record or legacy or chain that is housed there in the city of London. The money trail can be, you know, if there's anywhere that it can be unraveled to be traced back in time, it's through the city of London, where the banks have always kept the real banking power. And when there was the need for that military expansion, Washington, you know, America is the imperial the, you know, nothing more than the expansion of the English Empire, if you will. They just change names, but it's the same people and same money that moved over to America to build their military arm beyond reproach, their political system beyond any kind of authority, higher authority, to guard their financial system. But before all that was Vatican City where you could start using the army you already created in the Jesuits <laughs> and the, arm of the armies of different, let's say before there were country, but city states, the armies of Italy or France or England of their time that could be mobilized through the dictates of these bankers, say these Venetian bankers going back a thousand years, but at least as we know through the banking that starts up after the Crusades in the 1300s, 1400s. So you can trace all that. Vatican City, man, that's, that's where you start co-opting and controlling this religious, because that, you know, the religious understanding, that's the deepest one. I mean, come on, that comes down through Noah, perhaps, and his children, whatever the real origins of humanity you know, we have it as an allegory. We have it as a story, whether it's history or not. Noah and his family after the flood, however that plays out. You do have this remarkable unity of understanding in this sort of prehistorical times, thousands of years ago, these monuments around the earth. And these stories from Mexico to the Middle East. Africa, all over the world. Uh, so it's, it's you know, all the sundials, all the, any, the Persian Empire and all the Egyptian understanding, where did all that come from? You know, where, where's the history that leads up to it, the Atlantis, supposedly, and all that? Where did all that deep technology that was the ancient world, you know, what'd that come out of? 
So we surmise in our limited notion through scripture that it came out of this introduction of the dimensional spiritual thing through people like Enoch, through the sons of Noah, through the spreading of that knowledge that goes all the way back to its adversary at the Tower of Babel. However, what that represents, as I say, I doubt it represents people that thought they could build a physical structure to heaven. <laughs> really? Really? Above all the highest mountain? Why wouldn't you at least start on the highest mountain? If your goal is to build it to heaven in the sky. So it seems more like an allegory for becoming your own God and having a plan to do it. And that men actually had a plan that long ago to become their own God. As a natural progression, it's come down through needing to own or infiltrate or co-opt the spirit, the true spiritualist, the true believer, let's say, the one that really believes in a higher authority. So you have to give them a reason, not tell them there is no higher authority, but yeah, okay, here's your higher authority. Believe in this, right? So, okay, Vatican City. Money is what became the tool after it used to be standing armies. So you needed a God, you know, for everybody to fall behind, in behind. And a system of trade or whatever made your alliances in the days of, say, Greece or Persia. <clears throat> Excuse me. When it was a matter of alliances and standing armies that kept you in power. But once it became finance and financing both sides and all this kind of thing, which seems to have started to happen after the Crusades. That's probably what the Crusades were all about. And the getting of the gold and the financing of both sides and all this thing that seems to start kicking in somewhere in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries that becomes the method by which control is maintained. You still have your fight against the religious. So you should, Vatican City, always been funded. Nobody ever used the money to take them down, did they? Just to expand them. Then you got... You got the uh, city of London for consolidating all that money in banking. And then that quickly spreads to, to the new world order of America, where you can now have a political system beyond any higher authority, a military beyond any scrutiny, funding beyond any oversight, everything you need now to use the tools that you've perhaps been working for hundreds of years to put into place to finally get rid of religion officially, to officially start worshiping yourself at your temple. I believe that's what this final temple must have to do with. If there's such a thing as this spiritual path, this great work, this Masonic order, this uh, Luciferian doctrine, this esoteric understanding, the Kabbalah, all of this stuff leads to what exactly? <clears throat> if not a world in which the truth can finally shine free of all the religious constraint and burden, and manipulation. So they've had to Divide and conquer, divide and conquer, divide and conquer for a thousand years or more. Work both sides because that's how divide and conquer works. The uh, Ordo Ab Cow, order out of chaos. Create the chaos so that you can then implement the order that you see is appropriate. The Fabian Society with the thinkers that came up with the concept of you can't do it all at once. You got to take your time. You got to let it, you got to get into the positions of power one piece at a time. And if all of those people have a similar goal funded from a similar perspective, well then over time, the institutions of power all become levers for the same arm. And you can see that going on by a hundred years ago in America 
I think that's when, that's why, by a hundred years ago, the, all of these different things that have been worked on for a long time, perhaps hundreds of years, had come into position. You now had your Vatican City, your London City, your Washington, D.C. You have your army beyond reproach. You have your invisible funding. You have your corporate, uh, you have your divide and conquer. You, you have the world right where you need it to move forward with this plan that Albert Pike, that he'd been perhaps asked to put into place some years earlier. And at that time, you commence with it because it's primarily a financial plan. You're doing it through financing and you're doing it through this Fabian idea of it. I'm not trying to achieve it overnight, but of, no, of, of being certain that your success will be achieved over time. And that's the great work, I believe, that the, the true believers up against that can't be overcome through any resistance. That's why boob tube and all our social media, there's not a one of them. There's not a one of, not even the Christian stuff out there that's doing anything in a way of overcoming because there is no overcoming it. There's no way to overcome it. And anything that has any, any voice, I should say, any potential lever with with power will be co-opted immediately it has to be because that's the way that you know that's the method and so uh and that's why we're you know here we are 270 subscribers and you know two dozen <laughs> three dozen at the most listeners and out of that only a not even a handful that that respond so boy how do you even explain that in this world, who are you people? What is the odds of that? That we can be saying something so uh, clearly controversial and even timely, you know, it, it really does have to do with the moment. Are we in the end times or not? Is Jesus coming? Is there a rapture? Is, is any of that even true? Is, is, is scripture even valid? You know, even our metaphysical position is relevant today in the discussions that go on where the true thinker is trying to weave their way between the world of, of sort of the abyss of materialism that is that just requires you accept that everything unexplainable just be swallowed in one pill. So that there can be no mystery to life. It's just a simple, eh, there's, there is a physical explanation of how energy makes that happen. You just don't know it yet, but it explains everything. Oh, there you go. Swallow that pill and stay in materialism with your head cut off. Or what? Go the other route? Uh, what do I sit on a corner? singing Harry, you know, Krishna, Krishna songs? Do I uh, go to church every week to absolve myself for some unseen God? You know, how do I find uh, any truth there? So the truth thinker, I believe, has always been stuck in this world of trying to reconcile their own spirit with the truth. What could the truth be? I believe we've gone a long way to at least revealing some of the more you know, pertinent and relevant questions about metaphysics and consciousness and reality and morality and uh, the, that our channel now after this many, you know, three years and I don't know, 250 productions or something, it seems that, you know, we should have a little bit more voice, but we don't. We're really just a secret out here. And I still think the, the couple of dozen of you, you know, lucky buggers, huh? I mean, I had turned this off and no one would notice except a couple dozen people. So, uh, but I, you know, I feel it's part of my trip to, to be a, a unique voice in the same way I'm a unique builder. I build things that no one else seems to think about or, you know, and I get just enough response from people that appreciate it. 
that I realize I'm not just building uh, useless or oblivious, irrelevant things. I, I'm really building things of beauty, but they take time and energy and thought and and not many people are on that wavelength in the modern world. But a few people are and they, they see the stuff that I build and they appreciate it in it. So it brings me that, that circle, content with what, with what I'm doing. And, I, and so I get that from the few people here. I, I really look forward to being able to transfer us one of these days to a website and get away from boob tube. But for whatever reason, this is where the spirit led us and here we are. And maybe one day people will listen. I, I find our revisionist Bible study fascinating. And so I'm going to get back to that right away. But I just wanted to remind people that, you know, Christmas is really about recognizing Christ, Messiah, not about giving gifts or even being unselfish. That's that comes with recognizing Messiah. If, if Jesus is Messiah, if Christ is the Messiah who came and died and rose from the dead. And he knows the way to eternal life. He said, follow me. You know, these, this is what Christmas is about. Following Christ, the Messiah, every day. Celebrating it on the birthday of Tammuz. Okay, we could get a kick out of that if we knew that's what we were doing. Hey, Tammuz, up yours. Middle finger to Tammuz. You, you know, you tried to co-opt our religion, but you know what? You know, we're, we're going to be known for giving even more and sell, having a big party and calling it Christmas, Messiah Mass, on the birthday of Tammuz. But instead, we've let that day become just a tradition to us that hides the truth of Christianity from us. So... Christmas in the 21st century, I'm afraid, is, you know, one more piece of propaganda in the puzzle. It's one more deception. It's Santa Claus Christianity. And so uh, while I wish everyone a very Merry Christmas, I wish everyone every day would think of the poor and needy as, as the Messiah did would remember what was important to the Messiah, that loving our neighbor is what he commanded us to do. Not judging others is what we're commanded. That's not, here's what you should do. You, you ought, John said, to lay a life down for a friend because he did. He laid his life down and we ought to lay our lives down, says John. We're not commanded to, but John thinks we ought to. And so if anything on Christmas, there ought to be a bunch of believers out there laying their damn lives down for others, visiting prisons and, and taking care of those that are in the street. I mean, this should be, a, if there's any day when everyone in the street was fed and brought warm clothes and given some gift, if you're going to give a gift on Christmas, you know, it, this should be the day that every single person in the street feels it. And I'm afraid, you know, as much as some of them probably do receive the generosity, so many of them, it's an awfully cold day in Seattle or San Francisco, and people are busy giving their money to each other and rushing to and fro, and they don't even have time for what might be a normal gesture. Of charity. So anyway, I would like to remind people that Christmas in the 21st century is as big a lie as prosperity in the 21st century, of Christianity in the 21st century, of the free and great America in the 21st century. And you know, all these things are, are the great lies of the 21st century meant to enslave the most brain dead and brainwashed of all mankind of all history into being the dupes that can carry out the greatest genocides 
of all history, which is what our war machines and all this propaganda is going to bring sometime, perhaps in our lifetime. So, uh, yeah, you know, Merry Christmas. Go, go feed somebody today. I know probably we all have different plans. We're with our families and we bought our gifts and yeah, I don't want anybody to feel bad, but maybe tomorrow, you know, think of all those people in the street. Your leftovers could be given to someone. Maybe all that crappy gifts that you get bought could be passed on. Or if you get gifts that you like, you could take the old stuff that you have and go give that away tomorrow. Make the Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, a day that you remember, you know, what what the master, you know, what, what kind of life he led and that you're following him. So anyway, uh, Christmas in the 21st century. Wow. It's a sign, you know, let's end it on a higher note. It's a sign, you know, that we are at that apostasy that Paul talked about. We're at that place where even believers don't believe it. We don't follow him. We say it. We're believers. We're lukewarm Laodiceans. I believe, I believe, I believe. Thank you, Jesus. But we rush home to our comfort and we pray for our own comfort and we look for our own comfort first. And that's just the very thing that our master came and told us, you know, the way, you know the way to eternal life. You know where I'm going. You know how to get there. And the, the you know, the way, of course, is giving of ourselves. And so we've been robbed of that. And so I think, Christmas in the 21st century is a sign that we are very close. And we're going to talk this coming week about the other signs, that this whole Jerusalem propaganda, moving the embassy and all the tension that's creating, as it always does and is meant to, to take our eyes off of other things. But it's also to bring our attention to that issue. And that's very promising for those of us that are waiting for him to make a deal about building a temple and make a peace covenant. So stay tuned. Sorry I went so long today, but I, I didn't get anything done all week and I've been thinking about so many things. And I, you know, I do want everyone to have uh, a, uh, some sort of blessed Christmas between, between you and God, between you and the spirit, that uh, you're able to in, get some sort of encouragement to, uh, to take on this, this faith that we all proclaim and to walk this walk that wasn't meant to be easy. It's an easy burden, but it's not easy walk. Uh, to look at other people before yourself in our modern world is, is practically insanity. They can almost lock you up as insane. And if you were popular at doing it, they probably would lock you up as insane. Anyway, take care of each other. Try and love somebody who needs it and feed someone who's hungry before the year is out. Talk to you guys next year.